Listen to part of a lecture in a business class. Alternative dispute resolution. Now all of you know that business relations can go sour and that sometimes deals are broken and a solution needs to be reached. That's why I want to talk to you today about ADR or alternative dispute resolution. Some of you may have talked a little or a lot about ADR in one of your law classes, and that's great. You will find an overlap, and that's okay. ADR is really becoming a viable way to resolve problems without going to court, or it can be a way to shortcut a lengthy court process. So, if you have heard of some of this before, listen again because what you are going to hear today has the possibility of being very beneficial to you in your business endeavors and might even help you in other aspects of your life when there are disputes which need to be resolved. So, let's get started. ADR stands for Alternative Dispute Resolution. It's an alternative way to solve problems, a way to resolve problems without the intervention of courts and the legal system. Think about each of the three words. There has to be a dispute. The dispute needs to be resolved. And it is an alternative way to the traditional method of resolving problems in business, and the traditional way is through the courts. ADR is popular in all of the states, and in fact, some states permit types of ADR to happen before a lawsuit is filed. Now, not all states allow that, so in most cases, we're going to be talking about a process that takes place to try to resolve a problem after a lawsuit has been filed. There are several types of ADR. One of the most popular is mediation. Mediation is a process where a third person, a person who is neutral and doesn't have an interest in what the solution is, plays a role. And a process where a mediator, a neutral, tries to encourage and help resolve a dispute or problem between two or more parties. Now you all know that court hearings are adversarial. That is, lawyers are representing their parties and present the best case they can for their party. But in mediation, there's a difference. It's a non-adversarial process, and that means that the lawyers take off their hats as lawyers and work with clients to solve the problem with the other party. The process is non-adversarial and it is informal. There are no rigid rules that have to be followed, as in a court proceeding. The objective of mediation is for the parties themselves to decide what is the best way to solve the problem. You know that in a trial, that either the judge or a jury will make a decision for the parties. So that is one of the beauties of mediation. The parties are the ones who have a voice in the decision-making process and in the decision itself. It won't be the mediator who makes the decision. It will be the parties themselves. The mediator's role is to help the parties identify issues, encourage joint decision making, and explore settlement options. Another advantage of mediation is that it is confidential. Usually, what happens is this: a lawsuit is filed. Then, at some point, the judge can order the parties to sit down and try to resolve the issues, or one of the lawyers or a party to the lawsuit can ask the court. To order mediation, now that part of the process is known by the court, but nothing is told to the court about what is discussed in the mediation session, and sometimes more than one session is needed to work through all the problems. So that's another plus. It's confidential. If the parties don't reach a solution, then there is a report made to the court that there was no agreement reached, and the lawsuit continues. Now, if an agreement is reached. Then the agreement is filed with the court, and the agreement is binding on the parties. If a party decides not to follow through with the agreement, then everyone can go back into court, and the party who is not following the order can be punished with some kind of sanction. Another thing, the parties must mediate in good faith. Now that doesn't mean they have to reach an agreement; they just have to try to reach an agreement. But in reality, a great percentage of the lawsuits which are mediated do get settled outside of court. I am not going to talk about how mediators are trained or chosen or the actual process involved in mediation. If you are ever in a situation where you need mediation, those are things which you can find out then. Also, remember that not all states will have the same rules pertaining to mediation or any of the other ADR methods. But I have talked to you today about the concept of mediation and how it generally is structured. So next time we will talk about other types of ADR. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer.
Number one. What is the talk mainly about? Number two. In the lecture, the professor describes some advantages of mediation. Indicate whether each of the following is an advantage the instructor discussed. Click in the correct box for each phrase. Number three. Why does the professor mention the role of the mediator? Number four. According to the professor, what is one important goal of mediation? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Some of you may have talked a little or a lot about ADR in one of your law classes, and that's great. You will find an overlap, and that's okay. Number five. What does the professor mean when he says this? You will find an overlap, and that's okay. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Another thing: the parties must mediate in good faith. Now that doesn't mean they have to reach an agreement. They just have to try to reach an agreement. Number six. Why does the professor say this? They just have to try to reach an agreement. Listen to part of a conversation between a student and a professor. Cheating. Hello, professor. You wanted to see me? Yes, Wanda. Please come into my office. Why did you want me to schedule an appointment with you? Do you think I am not doing well in class? I wanted to see you because of your work on the last test. You know, on the first test, I felt you were struggling, and even on the second. I wasn't sure you were getting the points I was making in class. Well, didn't you think I did very well on the last test? You know, I really think I got almost all of the answers right. Yes, you did very well. Of course, I have not handed back the exams, so you don't know the score. But yes, you did very well. Did you study hard for the test, or is it just getting easier for you? Oh, I studied for it. Well, of course, you only attended one lecture between the last test and this one, but apparently you were able to get someone's notes to study. You know, it is fine to borrow notes when you need to. Oh, sure. Oh, yes, I did borrow Robert's notes to review the material. I see. Well, one of the reasons that I like to give exams that are completely essay. Is to see how much a student knows. Actually, I think essay exams are harder than multiple choice and fill in the blank or Scantron exams. Not to change the subject, but do you like the way I let students choose their own seats in class? Oh yeah, I think it's great. I noticed you came in just right before class on the day of the exam. Did you have any trouble finding a seat? Oh no. There was an empty seat next to Robert. I see. Well, Wanda, I want to read you something from your exam. The early English colonists first settled Jamestown in 1619. Their leaders signed a compact. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Well, now let me read something from another paper. The early English colonists first settled Jamestown in 1619. Their leaders signed a compact. Ah,、uh, I don't understand. Well, Wanda, this is one of several statements. In fact, some are whole paragraphs where your writings,、uh, I should say, your thoughts and statements, are exactly the same as another student's, word for word, sentence for sentence. And do you know that some of what you have written is not the correct answer? Do you want to explain? Well, I guess my eyes did wander a little. You know, I am working so many hours, and I haven't had the chance to come to class, and I haven't been able to read the material, and I really didn't borrow Robert's notes. I just knew he was a good student. Oh, 
I know I shouldn't have done it. I am so sorry. Well, Wanda, first, I want to thank you for being honest about what you did. Now, we do have a problem to solve. What should be done about the fact you cheated? What should be done about the test score? And what should be done about your total class grade? You know, the university permits me to fail you. I can also make you retake the class, and I can ask that you be suspended from school for cheating. I want you to go home and think about the problem and what you would do if you were in my shoes. And I want to meet with you next week at this time and have you tell me what kind of a decision I should make. And then we will talk about the decision I am going to make. You may go now. And I will see you a week from today at the same time here in my office. Okay. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number seven. Why does the student go to see the professor? Number eight. Why does the professor ask how the student liked the seating arrangement in class? Number nine. Why did the professor read the student part of her essay exam? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. I want you to go home and think about the problem and what you would do if you were in my shoes. And I want to meet with you next week at this time and have you tell me what kind of a decision I should make. Number 10. Why does the professor say this? I want you to go home and think about the problem. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. You know, the university permits me to fail you. I can also make you retake the class, and I can ask that you be suspended from school for cheating. Number 11. What can be inferred about the professor's remarks? <laughs>